kicking off the builders all hand call. Uh, so this is the first one, I think, in about a month. And so I wanted to just kind of do a quick overview again of the format, some announcements, and then we're going to do a little deep dive on gateways from Shane himself. So just a reminder on the format. So these calls are specifically to deep dive on relevant protocol topics, right? So Shane's done a bunch of presentations over the last couple of months. I think this one on gateways is kind of the last of the big ones that Shane wanted to get through. And so after this, we'd really like to open it up to other people building in the network and uh, protocol topics they want to talk about. I think Harry did a great one uh, a couple months ago. And so more, more of those deep dives, more of these like get people inspired to build on uh, Pockets protocol. Um, and I just keep thinking about like, how do we decrease the time to contribution for people coming into our ecosystem? So um, if we can get video content out where people are able to watch it on YouTube or reference it, or again, we have a couple of quick grants that are upgrading our documentation or working on DevRel, those type of things are really important. And my goal here is I really wanna make sure that we're building this library of content that people can reference. Um, when you think about saving the protocol team's time and saving the time of people like Shane, uh, anything we can get out in public to share around is going to expedite that. So really focusing on that as we move forward. Obviously, we want to provide all of our builders with important updates. So we don't have a lot of time where we do synchronous work. So if we can make sure that on these calls, any important updates are getting out there, um, and also on the ecosystem calls. So if things are more general uh, and less related to the protocol or the builders in the ecosystem. Um, but most importantly, we just wanna make sure that you all are heard and any updates that are coming out of the work that you are doing or the work that the protocol team's doing gets to the right people. And then the last piece is just kind of exploring grant projects. So again, decreasing this time to contribution, we have a lot of open grants right now um, and we also have things that we're trying to build. And so I keep coming back to the idea that we are uh, resource constrained on time uh, and not so constrained on funds at the moment. So really getting uh, mid to senior level builders or people with experience and reputation in the ecosystem building with us is gonna be our biggest priority. Um, and we wanna make sure that as people come into the community, they have uh, kind of directions for things that are being built and what to do. So that's the format of this call. Um, I just wanna go through some quick uh, housekeeping. So. Our next builder all hand is going to be May 2nd uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is 11 a.m. Pacific. And that's the regular time. It should be Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific for most people. Uh, we have invited the gateways to do a deep dive. So we recently announced three new gateways. Uh, really excited to have them building in the network. And it felt like this was a right opportunity to have everybody talk about what they're building uh, and what kind of tooling is being available for the community and new people coming in. So. Uh, we will have, I think, a, a big update from Blade um, on the Gateway Server and QS, QoS. And then I'm hoping that we'll get Liquify and Raid Guild um, and DevDAO, if they're available, to give us an update on some of the tooling that they're building as well. So again, the idea being if we can reduce duplication of work or find ways to get our resources to work more closely, that would be a huge win. Uh, a reminder to everybody that we do have four proposals up for vote on Snapshot right now. Um, that's an on-code club, one for creds, which is updating our governments, uh, one for retro PGF, which I think is really relevant to everybody here. So, uh, what kind of things are being built that are eligible for funding based on the impact they've had, especially outsized impact since it's been released. Um, and then there's a vote on the nodes for all recovery. Um, I also I, looking at the people here, uh, I think I want to call out for creds. So there's a couple of discussions on the forum right now, but I just want to remind people that the point of creds is to get more votes to active people. So if you're on this call and you don't have a current vote, uh, the goal is to make sure you have a way for your voice to be heard. Uh, currently, we have about 70 people with voting rights, and I think the most we've had vote in the last year has been about 30, 32. So we've got some real voter um, attrition. And we're really trying to get the people that are building and doing the work, um, the ability to have their voices heard. So I think it's important that we vote for opening it up and getting more people involved. So make sure you go to the snapshot and vote. drop that link in the form or in the uh, chat here too. Um, and then we started a new thing, which is the PNF office hours. So 
Wednesday from 4 to 6 Eastern or 1 to 3 Pacific. I'm going to be in there every week. Um, I'm trying to get uh, Shane to commit to a, a two-hour window where he'll be available, but I like to think of these as like completely unstructured time to come in and ask about anything. And I often feel like um, even calls like this, where it feels like either a top-down or a one-to-many call, there's not a place to ask questions or maybe you're not comfortable asking questions. Um, I, I feel like sometimes we think there's a lot of really smart people in the room and everybody has the answer to something or it must be so obvious that everybody knows and you don't. So really want to make space for people coming in to um, kind of ideate and brainstorm, uh, ask questions about things they don't understand. I think we had a pretty good discussion this week. You know, Ramiro was asking about self-dealing um, and I know Shane has a uh, had gone over this a couple of weeks ago in one of his presentations, but really trying to figure out how things are going to work and um, to get people's brains on it in a space where we don't have an agenda. So join us for those Wednesday office hours. I'll make an announcement when Shane uh, commits to his week each month and hopefully y'all can come in and we can just kind of come up with ideas and ways for, for us to improve the protocol. And then grants update. So uh, we have deployed a lot of quick grants. Uh, I'm trying to find a nice way to show what they're laddering up to. And so this is my attempt this week is what's currently out there between maintainers and quick, quick grants and kind of the big buckets that they're falling under here. So um, for tech and tooling, you know, you guys can read through most of these. I'm going to call out um, just a couple of pieces here. So on the community side, we have a pocket builders village. Uh, I'm really leaning into the idea that we need to find better ways to get people educated and to contributing. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the Polygon Village, but how do we take that idea and then um, build on it? And I think Optimism also has a good one. They have an Optimism Builder Ideas. And so I'm going to be working with uh, Murdad to start, but trying to figure out how we present ways for people to, uh, to work on maybe bigger projects that might not be obvious if you're new to the ecosystem, but give you some direction as to how you can slot in or fit in. Um, so if anybody does have interest in working on that project, and again, this is going to be a mix of like education, onboarding, ideation around like what the protocol actually needs, and then um, probably some amount of project manager maintenance for, for that protocol. Um, I would love your help or thoughts. So, Wednesday would be a great time to jump in and have a conversation with me. Or as always, you can DM me. Uh, cool. So I think if anybody wants to just take a second and look at these, I'm also going to drop the public notion that shows kind of all the quick grants and, the, and what they're working on. And just to like help people understand this, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, you know, for example, docs, who's working on it? So who would you go to if you had a question around docs or you needed something updated? And then kind of these bottom parts here, again, I'm just loosely categorizing all the different things that, you know, I'm just going to use Ciro on this, Ciro's website maintenance, uh, quick grant, you know, it's marketing documentation, website, and some design work. So um, because these are all DAO funded, if you have needs, you should feel comfortable reaching out to these individuals and asking for them to help you with it. They're building tooling for all of Pocket and all of you are part of Pocket. So. Feel free to coordinate directly with them, uh, jump into the forum and ask questions, or ping them in Discord too. Shane, how much more time do you need? Hey, uh, yeah, I'm basically ready to go. Okay, great. Maybe I'll give it a pause here. Does anybody have any questions about the grants or the tooling for the grants. Does anybody have any ideas on how we can make this better? I have no ideas, but I wanted to ask about the, the reviews. Are they are yes. you going to implement reviews on Karma or not? Oh, a hundred percent. So yeah, th thanks for bringing that up, Ramiro. So um, Karma is a tool that is currently being built as we're using it, and so 
It was originally built for grants that are given out by like Optimism. So you would finish an entire grant and then you would do the review. So currently he is building a milestone based review for us and that is ready. So with April updates for quick grants, we'll be able to go in and review your milestones and either give feedback or approve it. Um, so you'll see that at the end of this month, you're going to create a milestone, which says for the month of April, um, I expect them to do X, Y, and Z. Then at the end of the month, you'll give your update to say, how did I do versus those metrics? And so any quick grant going forward will fill out their update for end of the month and then start their milestone for the next month. You know, for example, if, if we're just going to use the website maintenance thing, again, you can say in May, I was expecting to update these three pages and create new designs for these four different pieces of the pages. And then at the end of the month, you just say, how did I do against that? And maybe add some additional color to that. And that's going to help us see if you're um, achieving the, the milestones that you're doing. And then if you're, I guess the, the idea would be if you're getting a bunch of additional work or if we should adjust the value of the grant based on what is getting done or close it down. The long-term goal is that anything done through Karma then becomes immediately eligible for the retro PGF when those are uh, going on. So we have we have one under vote right now, and then if we if that one is approved, we'll likely do another one towards the end of the year. And so any work that is done between now and then is going to automatically be eligible, and you won't have to go back in and refill out like impact for the grants that you're doing. All of that information is already going to be done. And so it's, it's the idea of like, how are we doing updates regularly versus having, you know, three hours of work in the future to get all of your updates and your impact in there. It was long winded. Okay, cool. And also related to that, uh, are you going to change that to an L2 or something like that to avoid the cost of placing the updates or how? Is there any update on that front? It is on Optimism right now, and it should be fairly cheap, if not um, very yeah, cheap. Yeah, it's very, very cheap. But I remember that you were talking about that at some point. Yeah, so the there was an optimization that happened. Originally, they were writing a lot to the chain, and then they optimized it. So it's going to be a few cents. And as part of opening the grant, if people need basically gas fee, I'm happy to, to transfer that to them. So. In the future, you shouldn't have that issue. Cool. Shane, I see you unmuted. You ready? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I am indeed. All right, I'm going to refresh and then kick it off. Sounds good. All right. Okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, let me uh yeah you'll you'll have to kind of carry the uh uh carry the the screen sharing so uh because uh, it's not working with my uh computer at the moment um, okay. okay all right everyone well um yeah wanted to basically give a deep dive into uh gateways now the kind of the purpose of this is is not to get into the technicals of gateways so much as just talking about why gateways. Um, gateways kind of are a novel feature to the Pocket Protocol, and uh, there's a lot of excitement around gateways and a lot of conversations around gateways, but uh, there hasn't really been good material that kind of defines why a gateway strategy is important uh, and kind of why it's unique um, and uh, why is it that it's a huge focus of what both pocket strategy now is with adding more gateways and why it's a, a big focus uh, for Shannon. So, uh, so yeah, going to the slide, uh, I wanted to give a quick history of uh, gateways. Um, so basically pocket in the original uh, vision was developers could access decentralized RPC uh, with an SDK. So at the time, I mean, this is, you know, Pocket was technically founded in, in around, uh, what, like 2017, 2018. And then uh, I actually joined uh, at the end of 2018. And then, uh, uh, and at the time, while all this was going on, 
you know, Ethereum SDKs were, were kind of a thing. Uh, they're starting to pop up, making it easy for people to interface directly with the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and uh, like on a, on a, uh, a call level, so you wouldn't have to call all, all your data in a, uh, uh, with the raw blockchain. You could actually just go through an SDK. It made data easy to get to you. Um, but the challenge was uh, for your SDKs to work, you had to have uh, an endpoint. You had to have a node. You had to have something to actually pull the data. So that's where Infura uh, was really the, the big guy at the time. And kind of the vision was, hey, what we could do is because there's all these Ethereum SDKs, we could actually have an SDK that makes it possible to just interface directly with Ethereum, take out the middleman. Uh, so that was kind of like the original vision of Pocket and very much still plays into uh, a lot of cool things that Shannon is going to unlock. Uh, but when Mainnet was launched, uh, Pocket did not have enough uh, SDK tooling to provide a seamless experience. So, uh, so that's why the gateway, uh, the first gateway, the Pocket Portal, was established as a short-term solution. Uh, when it was kind of first launched, it wasn't seen as like the... Um, you know, it, it wasn't seen as to be the, the center of pocket. It was just meant to allow people to start interfacing with the program uh, or with the protocol through an endpoint because they already have an uh, Ethereum SDK integrated into their system. And the pocket SDK was very minimal and there wasn't a lot you could do with it. So, hey, you can keep using your Ethereum SDKs that you're already using, but you can access this a decentralized protocol uh, through the Pocket Portal. And that was kind of the vision, that was kind of the branding, and, the, uh, and as the portal started to grow in usage and we started to see the value of it, um, that's what led to today with Gateways now kind of being a central strategy. And I'll kind of go into what Gateways provide that you can't get directly from an SDK uh, in, in a future slide, but, uh, Basically, what originally was a short-term solution, we actually found was a, uh, a a market, a possible market that Pocket could get into, um, where uh, you don't have to uh, just interface directly with a tool. You can actually have a, uh, a portal, a business. You can have something that's quickly iterating and adding new features. Uh, and... Honestly, also holding your hand uh, throughout the process because customer service is actually a big thing for developers. Um, and when they're accessing a blockchain, they really like to have that customer service or at least know that they have direct access to customer service. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but through the experiment of what originally was the Pocket Portal, it became evident that portals uh, or gateways, I should say, are actually going to be a central part of the network. And so today we're uh, making the central part of Shannon and it's now going to become a first tier actor in uh, the Shannon upgrade. Uh, and then as an ecosystem, we learned what actual RPC markets want. And we pivoted from a purist SDK strategy to one that incorporates gateways. So, uh, and then just kind of uh, uh, next slide. Uh, through the pocket portal, we realized that the majority Majority of the market wants UX that is akin to services with customer support instead of DIY. That's what we walked away with, uh, kind of the, uh, the portal experiment. That's the data that we walked away with. So why is that? Why is all this, uh, why, why do gateways really matter? Why is it that the market wants this? Well, um, the problem is, is if you think about other protocols, there's a lot of other protocols out there all trying to do either decentralized data, oracles, uh, what have you. Um, one of the biggest challenges is always the UX. The UX is, is, is almost a meme with how challenging it can be inside of Web3. Um, and so most criticism around Web3 utility tokens is their UX when compared to centralized services, their Web3 alternative um, is dramatically worse in a number of key areas. The, it's very complex to onboard. 
Uh, you typically have to deal with some kind of token. Um, you have to deal with the blockchain. You have to understand how everything's kind of working in order to fully integrate their service. Uh, there's typically a lack of features. They're behind the centralized guys in terms of what you can do with it. Um, they're very slow. Uh, uh, there's slow feature development. If you're going to add something new, so they're already behind in features, but then if you're going to add something new, man, it just it takes time because the whole protocol has to adjust in order to uh, make a new feature possible. And then uh, you have unpredictable quality of service. This is very true across a number of protocols that are actually live today. The QoS is very unpredictable. And Pocket has been able to uh, uh, kind of counter that because we haven't relied entirely on an SDK system. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But anything that is an SDK system, at least so far, the QoS has been very unpredictable. Um, and then there's always a varying cost because you're dealing with tokens. Uh, so the price of, uh, you know, the price of pocket can go up and down, right? And if we're basing everything and pegging everything in a, you know, fully decentralized way uh, to uh, strictly the pocket token, if the pocket token goes up, so does everyone's uh, cost for uh, sending a relay. And the problem is, is most businesses do not, uh, they don't um, uh, do their numbers uh, in terms of pocket. It's in something like USD, right? Most businesses operate off of USD to calculate their costs, uh, calculate their, their revenue. None of that's in pocket or in any other token. And so when you have a protocol that requires the token to be the center of it, and especially the center of uh, the value of the service, that creates a whole lot of issues because what business wants to operate where their costs go up 10% on their RPC calls uh, one day because the uh, pocket uh, token price has adjusted, you know, has changed. So those are all huge ways that, uh, huge problems that exist inside of the Web3 space uh, that the Web2 space doesn't have to deal with because obviously it's centralized. So to prevent Pocket from falling into the same cycle as these other projects, uh, Pocket is specifically designed to give the UX its own layer. And that is what we call gateways. So when you think of a service, uh, going on to the next slide, when you think of a service, it's, it's a pretty simple stack most of the time. You've got your users, which are then interfacing with some kind of user interface system. Uh, this could be a GUI, this could be whatever. But they're interfacing, uh, they, there's, a, there's a layer, there's a system that they specifically interface with. Then that system interfaces, uh, is then connected to a backend system that then interfaces with the actual data uh, of what they're actually wanting. So this is just a very basic stack of what a service is. In the Web3 space, um, there isn't, and I, and I don't have this slide, but in the Web3 space, a lot of times it just operates without that UX system. Or there's one UX system, but it's very clunky. It's everything else that I'd listed before is the user experience that, uh, that they have to deal with. So it's either a clunky UX system uh, or it's a limited UX system, but the UX in blockchains is the reason that blockchain hasn't been able to, and Web3 hasn't been able to compete with services on the centralized side. However, going to the next slide, what Pocket provides is a solution for each part of the stack. So you have a UX system, which are gateways. They're the ones interfacing with users, providing all the user experiences that they need in order to uh, uh, in order to get access to the data that they need to access without all the overhead of doing it in a DIY fashion. Uh, and then obviously Pocket provides the, uh, the pro protocol itself, which operates as the backend systems. And then you have the gateways, or, and then you have the data, which are the blockchain nodes. So no surprise there, 
That's how Pocket operates. So going to the next slide, instead of having one uh, system for the user interface, which can be very subjective, what features should be there, what, fe what features shouldn't be there, what is a good experience for one developer might not be a good experience for another developer. These are all questions and challenges that Web3 uh, or any, any system that has a single U, UX has to worry about. But with Pocket, we're actually, we're actually distributing this to where anyone can build on this UX layer. You have someone, you can have Grove, Nodis, Liquify, Raid Guild, Developer Dev. These are all gateways that have, um, uh, that have already built on gateway or built on Pocket uh, or are committed to building on Pocket. Uh, some, many of these have received uh, grant funds to build on Pocket. So uh, Pocket is actively investing into having multiple ways that the UX layer is not one experience, but it actually is distributed to where you can pick your experience. You can go to someone like Grove. You could go to someone like uh, Raid Guild. They're actually doing online, or I should say on-chain uh, payments. And it's actually really cool, some of the things that they're building into their portal. So if someone wants to do on-chain payments, you could go entirely through Raid Guild. Um, I don't want to speak too early. They're, <laughs> they're still in development and everything. But uh, a lot of really cool things happening there. But this is, this is what a Pocket is going to be enabling, is where this layer is populated by all sorts of different businesses, all sorts of different services, all sorts of different uh, user experiences. So every market, every niche group of uh, developers could potentially find a place inside of one of the services that are inside of this UX layer. Go on to the next slide. So these, all these different uh, gateways that I listed, it's important to understand that these are businesses. So Pocket is actually creating a business layer inside of the UX layer. Um, and so the purpose of these gateways are ultimately to connect users to the Pocket network. Uh, they can have similar UX experiences to the centralized services, uh, but they have an unstoppable and, I should say, backend, uh, which is the Pocket Network. Um, gateways themselves are real-world businesses. This isn't something where uh, you should have to build inside of Pocket's gateway ecosystem as a charity. <laughs> this should, uh, Shannon itself and Pocket itself, should be around enabling people to grow their own businesses, build their own businesses, um, bring their own businesses into this UX layer uh, because they are incentivized to specialize in certain areas. So they can add new features. Some features that, uh, many features that already exist in today's gateways are you can have URL endpoints. Uh, you don't have to integrate an SDK into your code and uh, worry about any of that, you can have a URL uh, endpoint, uh, just sign up, get a URL endpoint, and you're using Pocket. Uh, you can have monitoring, and SDK doesn't give you monitoring, because you still have to have some kind of server somewhere that's taking all this data, that's then able to make it accessible to you. Uh, it, it, monitoring is, is no, uh, no simple thing to just do with an SDK. It would be incredibly complex, unless there's a lot of cool tooling, but all of that can be built in time. Right now, uh, no matter what, you know, no matter what uh, other protocol you deal with, monitoring is always a real challenge, uh, especially when you're in a data industry like Pocket. Uh, simple payments. Uh, right now, if you go with Grove, uh, you can just pay for USD. You don't have to even interface with the token itself. You can just pay USD and then get access to Pocket. Uh, with what Raid Guild is building, uh, you can do that on chain, but you can do that potentially through USD or some other stablecoin on chain.
but it's the same, it's a similar experience. You don't have to interface with the pocket token if you don't want to. Um, and then outside of adding new, uh, or, and then there's also uh, custom APIs, and I put an extra S here apparently just to show how, how many more APIs you can, uh, you can actually have here. <laughs> because the idea of custom APIs is there's going to be all sorts of niche markets. There's going to be ways that people are going to need new information. And if everything is reliant on the protocol to, uh, to synthesize uh, how data has to flow uh, to all users, it's going to be very, it's going to be a very long process to, to be able to compete on the level that uh, a lot of these other data services are competing on. So take Morales, uh, they're an RPC provider. They have a lot of custom APIs for tracking things like NFTs, uh, certain smart contracts, things like that. They went heavy into the custom API space. And many other larger providers are also leaning heavily into their own custom APIs. Uh, this is where literally the entire market right now is moving. And Pocket needs to be moving in that place as well. And any protocols that require any new custom APIs to be hard-coded uh, or, or something that kind of happens on the protocol level side, it's just going to be much slower. Um, the benefit of gateways is they can just add new features. They can add new uh, new APIs that then on their back end, they're able to utilize the pocket network to get all the proper data that they need. Uh, but then they just repackage it in a way that uh, uh, provides users uh, with basically an abstraction layer uh, to not have to deal with all the raw data. And that's what gateways get to innovate on. So pocket actually has the ability to have these... Uh, uh, people to innovate on how data is uh, packaged and sent to users uh, through this gateway layer. Uh, they're also incentivized to reach niche markets, as I already mentioned, uh, different developers that are developing different types of smart contracts or NFTs, uh, or even on different chains. Um, there's going to be a lot of niche needs, and you can actually have gateways that pop up just to handle certain uh, use cases and abstract away a lot of the uh, a lot of the hard bits that like if someone was trying to do NFTs, uh, you can abstract away a lot of that by just having a gateway that is well built for handling NFT data uh, and utilizes then the pocket network to not have to have a huge infrastructure cost. Uh, and then they're also able to provide customer support, uh, customer service. That is a big one. That really is a big one. Uh, when I first started selling, because, uh, well, I started selling uh, pocket tokens directly to node runners uh, when mainnet launched. And then after we had a healthy base of node runners, then the focus shifted to then selling to, uh, or not necessarily selling, but uh, starting to offer the portal, the pocket portal, um, to users and trying to find users to uh, partner with and uh, start building a, a business around the uh, pocket portal. And user experience or uh, customer support is just such a big one, which is one of the reasons why, it's one of the biggest reasons why developers will, instead of running their own node, which they could likely do cheaper in some cases, uh, they could uh, you know, maybe run a node cheaper than uh, paying for someone like Infura or something like that. But because there's an entire team behind Infura, maintaining everything, and then providing them direct customer support, creating them with resources, materials, things of that nature, that is such a value add to 90% of projects out there. Um, it is. It, it can't be understated how important uh, customer service is to a lot of these developers and what they're looking for when they uh, uh, when they are looking for uh, basically a service to provide them data because blockchain data can get very confusing very fast. There's a lot of variables in it and it is nice to have a professional that is able to tell you what your problem is. And so that's just a huge part of uh, uh, what ultimately gateways will likely become and provide within the pocket network. Because the network itself is structured to incentivize gateways, to pay gateways and make them a, a, a tier one actor inside of the network, 
um, the idea is, is all these areas that incentivize businesses to grow, uh, or all these areas that incentivize uh, growth, businesses can do with really cheap infrastructure through Pocket. So going to the next slide, if you think of this as um, if Pocket has an unlimited UX layer, then there is no limitations to where uh, Pocket can go. Ben makes gateways permissionless um, and part of the protocol itself, enabling Pocket to truly be the base layer of an unlimited number of user experiences. Uh, is there any other protocol, and I realize I got a spelling error there, is there any other protocol layer, um, any other protocol that has a, uh, a protocol layer dedicated to UX? And that's kind of my uh, big point with, uh, with all of this, is this is where Pocket is truly different than every other data protocol out there. There isn't a layer that I've found inside of uh, kind of the data space that uh, is focused on the area that, that Pocket is focused on. All right, next slide. Uh, just about done here. Wanted to touch on a few things with uh, understanding then what gateways are gonna be like in Shannon. So uh, in past presentations, I already talked about how uh, the, the differences between Morse and Shannon in a lot of different areas, including uh, some gateways. But um, uh, just to summarize, uh, gateways in Shannon operate entirely on chain and are permissionless. This allows the pocket side, uh, the pocket demand side to grow without today's legal uh, restrictions. Because right now, if someone wants to become a gateway on Morse, you have to sign a contract PNF. There's all these things that you have to do because uh, Morse isn't truly uh, built right now to enable trustless gateways, because there's ways that gateways could game the system. So there has, so with Shannon, that's one of the biggest things that we were actually talking about in the uh, office, uh, open office hours, uh, I believe yesterday, was um, that's one of the North Stars of Shannon, is we have to have a permissionless demand side, so you don't have to go through PNF, you don't have to go through a legal uh, contract in order to get access to cheaper infrastructure. Um, and gateways uh, in Shannon will have permissionless staking. Uh, they can have on-chain payments and then tooling for easily onboarding and QoS. And actually QoS was something that I failed to mention in the uh, uh, a few slides up when I was talking about what gateways can provide, but QoS is a big one. Um, being able to identify uh, why certain calls aren't working, under understanding the ins and outs of certain nodes and certain networks and how to provide that data and the best availability possible um, to identify which nodes are, you know, which nodes should be receiving what data from what users. That's a very big, uh, that's a very big undertaking that has to be very chain specific and it, even at times user specific. And gateways can take all that, uh, uh, can take all that on and innovate in that space without requiring the whole network to make massive changes. Um, but tooling uh, is, is gonna be a, a, something that's a big focus right now, which is why PNF's invested into Gateway Server so that gateways can essentially connect to the pocket network in a super seamless fashion, get uh, custom, be able to set up custom QoS and everything like that, that all through essentially one package. And there's more tooling that is gonna be a big focus on uh, uh, coming up with Shannon to then, as we open this up to be permissionless, there will be a lot of tools that the gateway ecosystem and businesses can grab, utilize to easily connect to the pocket network and start being a gateway without much hassle. So that's what uh, gateways in Shannon, that's kind of the vision for them. Uh, and then kind of the, my final slide here is, uh, the um, gateways in Shannon and kind of the staking goals. So again, with, with thinking about gateways as businesses uh, and they need to be able to interface with the protocol, there's essentially two main goals that our staking system needs to uh, account for. And number one, minimum protocol interactions. Allow gateways to interface with Pocket itself 
uh, the least amount of times, thus reducing friction. Uh, if they're having to constantly be reading the chain, following price movement, following, uh, you know, maybe, you know, following the market of, of how much uh, relays cost at any given moment, um, all of that, the amount of times that they have to interface with Pocket, the protocol itself, uh, is going to deter more businesses from utilizing Pocket. And so we want to have minimal protocol interactions. This is where good tooling comes in. Um, this is where, uh, you know, just good support on a, on a network level. And this is what PNF has been focused on doing with uh, helping onboard gateways, helping make it uh, uh, as simple a process as possible. Um, all of that plays into uh, uh, what is business viable for uh, other companies, other businesses, entrepreneurs to come to pocket and start building. Um, so minimal protocol interactions and then number two, consistent cost in USD. This is a, just a huge one. Gateways are businesses, which means they need to have predictable costs. Uh, the cost per relay needs to be pegged to a USD value while uh, even while the uh, price of pocket fluctuates. That's just a huge one. We can't have businesses being built on pocket uh, where they, their costs can go up 30% in one month, right? And granted, at times they can go down 30% in one month. But by and large, I would say 95% of businesses, uh, I would put that high of a price tag on this, that that amount of businesses just want consistent costs. Um, they don't want the fluctuating costs because, uh, yeah, they could maybe save a little money on some months, but really when it comes down to budgeting, it's the months that you uh, uh, get an unexpected amount of uh, increase from a token changing that can really crush a business and not make it sustainable in the long term. So uh, currently staking is a work in progress, uh, but these are kind of like North Star, what we want to accomplish so real businesses can build in the gateway ecosystem. Um, this, all of this, I, you know, I know I kind of rushed through this, but, uh, yeah, wanted to kind of open it up and, and open up a conversation, see if people have any questions about, uh, kind of gateways on this conceptual level on what gateways are, uh, how they fit, how, how it's different from other ecosystems and other protocols, um, and, uh, uh, really open up people's minds on what gateways are so that we can see where the real market fits of Pocket can be inside of blockchain RPC, AI, all these other areas that uh, ultimately Pocket can go into any data area. So any of these areas um, understand where this gateway layer uh, plays into where Pocket can ultimately go. So there we go. My man. Now, now I haven't been following at all the uh, the chat. Um, so let me see if there's anything. Okay. Yep. Nope. Nothing specific in the chat about. Yeah. Any uh, thoughts or questions? I will uh, preface this with. Uh, Everything I'm sharing now, uh, a lot of this has been my own, uh, kind of my own work that I've been uh, doing um, as, a, as kind of like a contractor with PNF. So this doesn't necessarily represent, uh, you know, none of this is official yet in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the phrasing or, uh, you know, anything I said is not official official. But this is what I've been working on. I've been working with the protocol team, working with PNF, uh, kind of trying to bring this concept together um, into a presentable way. We actually have a document uh, that I actually pulled a, a bunch of this information from that we are hoping to release in the next uh, couple. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping next week. I'm going to be very focused on doing uh, doing a lot of this stuff next week. Um, but most likely, it'll be uh, in a week or two that will actually release this document, but it'll give people a 
full overview of everything possible in Xanon. So uh, be, be on the lookout for that, but, that's, uh, but I wanted to kind of give a teaser and open up a conversation if, uh, and see if anyone had any thoughts or questions uh, as we're kind of flexing all this stuff out in a uh, digestible way. Yeah, not marketing yet approved. Nice one, Zach. Yeah, I want to, I guess I'll say from my point of view, um, thinking of it as an app layer is actually, sorry, a UX layer is super helpful. Um, but that framing kind of unlocked a couple things in my head. So, and I think it's also really easy to, to explain to others in that way too. So I appreciate that analogy. And oh boy, there's so much you can do with this, which is really cool to think about. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can. It's is the tar, actually. I'm oh. using my jumpy JoJo avatar. Um, yeah, so it sounds like um, so you're in this UX layer, the gateways, a lot of private companies operating. Uh, but given the importance of UX to attracting new people into pocket, uh, and gaining, you know, widespread adoption, popularization. Um, are we going to be sharing, the, you know, the the, the um, developments in UX, or is the PNF going to be working on, you know, encouraging, you know, DAO initiatives to improve UX in in conjunction with the work of the private companies? I mean, how much is private? How much is, you know, DAO uh, initiatives at that on the the UX layer, the gateway layer? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and actually, uh, uh, so for just some context, uh, yeah, PNF at least you could look historically at where their funding has gone. Uh, they've invested heavily in uh, UX, uh, in, in kind of building up this UX layer, meaning building up the, the gateway layer. So uh, you have a gateway server. Uh, which is making it easy for people to access uh, Pocket itself. You then have Raid Guild and Liquify, which are both building open source gateways um, that uh, would actually be our first fully open source gateway. Um, uh, actually, the, the first portal uh, was mostly open source, um, but uh, yeah, with what, uh, but it, it was also an early version. So now you have Liquify and you have Raid Guild building. What I would call, you know, modern, uh, you know, uh, building. I should say building on what we've already learned inside of Pocket. <laughs> the first, the first portal had to go through a lot of uh, challenges, but uh, uh, luckily, Raid Guild and Liquify can actually build with a lot of that knowledge that has already been learned from the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and so there will be two, you know, at least two fully open source gateways. Um, that other people could literally fork and you know modify themselves to launch their own business to potentially uh, you know attract a certain niche or utilize their brand in a certain way to uh, reach you know new users uh, and monetize basically monetize access to Pocket and that's really what this UX layer is about. It's about monetizing access um, and then the UX or and then the gateway itself. Obviously, they get a cut from the, uh, you know, because they're targeting the users themselves. So they can have a cut uh, of whatever they want to put their price. They can be, you know, super uh, competitive and turn, or they can be right on par with uh, centralized services if they want to be, or they can, uh, you know, really cut things down and be super competitive uh, and win users through pricing. So you can go through all those different routes. Anyways, all that to say, uh, yeah, there, there's been a lot that's been going into this building out this UX layer and making this UX layer something where businesses can be built on. And I think the fact that there is, you know, Grove, who's already done a fundraise on being a UX, uh, uh, you know, a, an, a UX access to Pocket. They've literally raised on being a gateway. So 
that it, that's just a really cool way to see that real businesses can be built in this kind of structure. Uh, and then on top of that, you have, again, nodes, you have uh, Liquify, you have Raid Guild, uh, and you have developer DAO that are all building literal businesses on top of this UX layer. So there's all of that uh, that is happening and is being developed. Um, and then I think it is important to mention this comment from uh, Five Law, which is perfect, which says uh, apps can uh, apps can act directly with the network in the same way uh, a gateway does. Uh, uh, as a gateway does too for those uh, who are really DIY. So basically, gateways are abstracting away, just needing to interface with the protocol directly. But anyone could still interface with the protocol directly. And this is where uh, you know potential projects that want to be ultimate decentralized, they don't really care so much about trying to uh, have a certain user experience. They're not trying to get certain data metrics. Uh, you know, maybe it could literally be some kind of decentralized service that just like a wallet that just needs decentralized access and they don't care about the metrics. They don't care about all these uh, other uh, features that they can get from a gateway. They just want data in a reasonable way uh, with enough tooling to get good data, which is what the Shannon SDK is going to allow. Um, so they get good data directly from the source itself without needing to go through a gateway, that is absolutely a viable option within Pocket. And I would expect that there's going to be all sorts of different projects that are going to utilize that route because then you don't have to pay the gateway. Uh, in the, do you see the possibility of these private companies uh, leveraging DAO talent by way of uh, a quick grant or you know, some one of these funding avenues that we have to help develop UX. Um, so sort of be a cross between private and public. Are you thinking like a toolkit? Well, let's say uh, uh, Grove wants to develop something for their UX uh, system. And they want to take advantage of the talent in the DAO to 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 build it, um, I mean, is that a, a possibility? It could be through a quick grant or you know something else. And I guess whatever is built would be shared by everybody, all the all the private companies. Oh, hey, hey, can folks hear me? Yeah, you're cutting out a little there, Shane. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, Zatar, I, I guess we don't have a mechanism for that yet, but like I would absolutely think that if a like like as we're trying to do what I'm calling the pocket village, you know, I would absolutely want everybody who's building on the network to feel um empowered to spend funds to create open, you know, open source tooling. Um it, it's not a thing that we want them to build something that only they can use, but if it was gonna be a QoS piece, or let's just call it like a, a front end um, UI or something. If that's open and everybody could use it, like there's no reason they can't go make a vote um, for creating that for the network. And PNF can help facilitate that. But again, it's it's Grove's DAO as well. They should be able to just create a proposal and go ahead and create that. We haven't seen it done yet, though. Thanks. Um, Shane, are you, I, I feel like you cut out a little, is there something you wanted to wrap up with? I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I started talking about, uh, H5 laws, uh, comment. Did, did any of that catch or <laughs> was I got most that? of it? Yeah. I think we okay. got the majority of what you were saying. So uh, that's good. That's good. Um, I realize we are over time as well. So I guess we can officially uh, wrap it here and just reminder that we have our next builder call in two weeks on May 2nd. Uh, it's in the Discord. It'll be at 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, but if people do want to stick around and keep chatting, uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes and chain. If you can stick around, that'd be great too. Yeah, and uh, kind of with the next builder call, 
uh, with the next builder call, I mean, kind of the idea is we'd like to uh, uh, actually have gateways and kind of talk about uh, uh, talk about what they're building, right? Uh, what what are the actual tools? What are the things that they're building uh, inside of the um, uh, inside of this UX layer, right? Inside of the the gateway ecosystem. So, yeah. Anyways, that's kind of what we're wanting this uh, this meeting to kind of tee up them talking specifically about then what they're building and ideally this can open up conversations on you know what other markets there might be what other features what other technologies uh, could actually be built inside of this layer to kind of grow this this ecosystem of people wanting to create businesses that really act as a ux to data that is on the pocket protocol Great. I'm looking forward to sharing more what we've done at Liquify uh, in that call. Cause we built some quite cool tooling, which should be nice for the new gateways on board. Oh, yeah. Did Give you say the that? Dude dude from from May. May, did you say? I'm sorry, what was that, Andy? I missed it. What was the date of the next call again? Just my calendar. Uh, two weeks from now, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? On a Thursday, though, right? Except it'd be on yeah, on Thursday, right? Back to being Thursdays. Uh, was it 1 p.m., Zach? Uh, May 2nd, it's going to be at 11 a.m. Pacific or 2 p.m. Eastern, and it'll be correct in the okay. Discord. I'll make sure it, it should be the regular time, but I'll ping you, Andy. I'm going to ping you separately and coordinate with um, all the teams next week. All right, y'all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming on a Friday. Appreciate your time. Gresh, I'm, I'm happy to open it up here if you want to ask your questions. And we'll kill the recordings now. And yeah, have a great weekend, everybody. See you next week.